It's an honor to welcome you to our fifth and final session at the Israel at 75 virtual book series, co-sponsored by the Jewish Federation and Moment Magazine as part of Federation's ongoing Israel at 75 initiative. Federation is proud to partner with incredible institutions like Moment as we mark this milestone year of Israel's independence and to offer community members thought-provoking opportunities to engage with Israel during what are quite complex times. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of diving into uh, Ronit Matalom's and the Bride Closed the Door with Dr. Shulamit Reinhardt's. It's a thrill to welcome you, Dr. Reinhardt's, as Thank you are you. known for both your academic and scholarship contributions, as well as your unique leadership in, in women's studies, raising the voice and inclusion of women both within the Jewish space and beyond. Dr. Reinhardt was the Jacob Potofsky Professor of Sociology at Brandeis University until 2017. During her tenure at Brandeis, she was the director of the Women's Studies Program from 1991 to 2001 and launched the Scholars Program, the first graduate program to focus on Jewish women. She was the founding director of the Hadassah Brandeis Institute and founding founder and director of the Women's Studies Research and Center. Dr. Reinhardt is also currently a member of the advisory board of the Women's of the Remember the Women Institute, part of me. We'll be led again by Amy Schwartz, Moment Magazine's opinion and book editor, as well as the editor of the magazine's popular Ask the Rabbi section. Before coming to Moment, Amy was a longtime editorial writer and op-ed columnist at the Washington Post, covering education, science, culture, and where she was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in the commentary. Please join us. And welcoming Amy. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you, Manny, and uh, welcome uh, to Dr. Shulamit Reinhardt. It's um, as as Manny said. I won't go over all the things he said, but it's really it's a pleasure and an honor to to talk with you about uh, Rodi Matalon. Um, since Manny t told um, already described all your um, accomplishments, I'm just going to say a word or two about the author we're discussing before we jump in. Um, Ronit Matalon, the author of this book, And the Bride Closed the Door, was born in 1959 in Ghana Tikva, Israel, to Egyptian Jewish immigrants and was raised in a poor immigrant neighborhood that had been established as a Ma'abara, a transition camp created to house Mizrahi immigrants to Israel in the 50s. Um, so she grew up poor and on the margins. I believe her mother cleaned houses. Um, in 2009, she was awarded the Bernstein Prize um, for Hebrew writers under the age of 50, and she received many other awards, including the Prime Minister's Prize, the Brenner Prize, and was awarded an honorary doctorate from Hebrew University in 2010. She wrote nine novels um, and died of cancer in 2017 at age 58, tragically, just after this novel we're discussing had won a major prize. Um, Shulamit, it's such a pleasure to speak with you about on this subject. Um, I want to start by saying you were the one a few years back who brought Matalon and this novel to my attention. Um, I'll, you reached out and suggested that we write about it, which, which you then did for a moment, and I, we are you know, much, much obliged. <laughs> um, I'll also mention to start out that it's very short. It's in fact, it's sometimes called a novella or even a extended short story, which is convenient for the purposes of this series, since our purpose was to um, give you a, um, a kind of a, a, a tour of all the Israeli, uh, you know, survey of all these different genres of Israeli literature. Um, anyway, when you reached out to me um, in 2017, Matalon had recently passed away. She had, her book had just, had recently been published into English and had won the Brenner Prize. Can you start by just telling about the book, how you encountered it, and what is so noteworthy about it? Sure. Uh, to fill in what you uh, what you said is an introduction. It's 128 pages, and if if you forget my posties here, uh, it's a small book. You know, just in terms of the square inches, but every sentence is just packed with humor and insight and intrigue. It is very dissimilar to her other books, 
many of her other books uh, deal with her criticism of the Mizrahi experience in Israel. And it's worth noting, I think, since you mentioned the Ma'abara, Ma'abarot, where these uh, immigrants from North Africa went, that many of them became poor in the Ma'abarot. They didn't necessarily come poor. And according to what I've read, Ronit's mother was actually a well-off woman. The whole issue of um, the place of Mizrahi Jews, by Mizrahi I mean North Africa, as opposed to Ashkenazi or Sephardi, Sephardi being people who came originally in 1492 from Spain and populated the Middle East. Anyhow, this the whole um, focus of our understanding of Mizrahi Jews needs to be changed. And uh, Ronit Matalon can help us do that. So what do I mean needs to be changed? I'll just give you an example. I've never been to Egypt, but I have been to Morocco. And Morocco is also Mizrahi Jews. And while I was visiting there, I asked every Jew I met, um, why did you go to, Pal to Palestine or Israel? Or why didn't you go? And I got the most surprising answers. I, I thought mistakenly that people fled to uh, Palestine or Israel from, in this case, Morocco, but also Egypt, um, fled like because of the anti-Semitism in the Middle East or in North Africa, fled like Ashkenazi Jews fled from Europe, but it's not entirely the case. The, the case is that, and I'm not going to go into it deeply because that's not our point here, but the um, Jews of Egypt and Morocco and the countries in between were encouraged, I'm not going to say forced because they were not forced, but they were practically drawn out of these countries to build up the population of Palestine and Israel. And for that reason, these people, I mean, for that reason and other reasons, I'm sure, these people have a longing for the culture and the way of life they had, and they don't necessarily feel that they needed to go away. So mm. it's a different dynamic. And one last thing about this that I want to say is that um, I think we have to balance the history and the understanding of Israel. There are more Mizrahi Jews than there are Ashkenazi Jews. But the Ashkenazi Jews have the power and they have their voice in literature. The, we have um, the March of the Living, for example, where young and older people visit Auschwitz and then go to Israel, seeing Israel as the rescue, the alternative, the harbor were the Ashkenazi Jews. We need to have a March of the Living for Morocco and for Egypt, because that's where the vast part of our population came from, so that people will understand Israel in a new and different way. Hmm. We, don't, we don't have that yet. I'm going to wait for Manny to do that coming from uh, <laughs> Washington. But we do have writers. We have some writers. And um, the... One of the most interesting writers, I think, is Ronit Matalon. She has uh, numerous books. I brought you some to see. One is called Bliss. Another one is called And the One Facing Us. Mm -hmm. And the, the other one is called The Sound of Our Steps. And The Sound of Our Steps in particular talks about what it was like to move to Palestine and, and Israel. And you say that this book is um, atypical, that it doesn't, um, it's, it's a different landscape. So, that is correct. There's so, only, in this, in this book that. that we're talking about, uh, there's only one, as far as I can see, a non-Ashkenazi character, and that is the grandmother. The grandmother is, doesn't see well, doesn't hear well, but is loving and is a person who appreciates her really um, blazingly gay grandson. 
So, you know, it's like two people on the outside sort of love each other, but it's not a model of where we're going to go forward. So she's a great character, but she, she can't carry the weight of what we need to do on Israel on her shoulders. How's you that? Think, you, think, you think, well, I mean, we can get back to the, these things, but part, part of, you think part of her purpose in the, um, in the book is to sort of see these crazy Ashkenazi characters from the outside? I mean, because that's one was one thing I thought of reading was that they're almost they're such grotesques the the main characters in the story. Right. Yes and no. I mean, she does see them from the outside, but she really doesn't hear very well, so she doesn't know what's going on. The mm -hmm. people in the family were talking about news, and she thought they were talking about booze, and so it was you know very mixed up. But she's yes. loving in an unconditional way. Uh, she's respected. But she's on the way out, let's say. Um, oh, and she's she's that she's that part of the culture that so let's let's talk about the way these things play out in the story. Um, okay. You 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 um you used the term before, you said it's it's almost a comedy of manners. Um, it definitely is. So, and so I thought I would uh, in case uh, readers have not yet read the book, I thought I would just give some examples of how funny it is. Um, and I, what I wrote in preparation for today is the book goes down easy. It's a one sit read if you have a couple of hours. I read it again it, on the train yesterday. And yeah. Wasn't it fun the second time around? Oh, better and better. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's fun because of the humor, gentle humor, uh, sarcastic humor, but not nasty, I would say, in any way. Um, some of it is very subtle, and some of it is very far out, especially so especially the funny analogies or metaphors she uses. So I thought I would just read the first paragraph of the book and tell you why I thought it was funny. Of course, humor is not necessarily perceived the same way by everyone who reads it. You know. So here, quote, the young bride who had been locked in her room in utter silence, finally made her announcement, then repeated the astonishing declaration three times. Now watch the numbers here. From behind the closed door, through which four pairs of ears. Now, instead of saying four, uh, four people or her parents, four pairs of ears, uh, as, as, as if they were embodied um, listeners, four pairs of ears, listened anxiously and with the utmost devotion, not getting married, this is her three times, not getting married, not getting married, she recited in a flat, almost bored voice that sounded extremely distant and nebulous. Now here's the crazy analogy, like the final vapors of a scented cleaning spray which has nothing to do with what is going on, but reminds us that was that was her mother. Her mother was a cleaner for the city of Petah Tikba. Um, next, Matalon also treats us to wonderful, awkward, unappealing descriptions of people's bodies and clothing. Here's a paragraph about that. I'm cold, said the bride's mother, Nadia. She tried to encircle her fleshy shoulders. So it's already funny. She has fleshy shoulders, whatever that is. And she's trying to encircle them with her own arms, which were encased in the tight fitting prickly face lace sleeves of the light gray evening gown she had been trying on, comma, at the hairstylist's request, comma, though her feet were absent-mindedly clad in plaid winter slippers with zippers down the front. I love that. <laughs> the slippers. <laughs> All right. And it was the hairstylist who wanted to try it on and her fleshy arms and prickly lace. You get an image of this woman. 
and it's the day, you know, this the day of an evening wedding, and everyone's sort of half dressed in different ways, right? Exactly. I mean, that captures it. It captures that too. The the family's at this weird stage of sort of semi preparation. Nobody's really dressed, you know. Exactly um, right. They're, all they're just dressed up enough to be uncomfortable, you know. That's right. Or flamboyant. And flam right or flamboyant. Right. And, and, and the grandmother and the flamboyant uh, grandson, they're impervious to this, and in fact. The grandson makes his outfit more and more flamboyant, which is the opposite of what this Ashkenazi family wants. Right. And when he actually would not to spoil the scenes, but when 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 someone finally has to go and announce to the packed catering hall that the bride's not coming, the wedding's not going to happen. Who goes this this crazy um, <laughs> this crazy nephew? And he decides that the thing he should wear is the bride's Israeli army uniform, which is, you know, skirted. It's a woman's uniform. And they say, why do you want to wear that? And he says, oh, you know, in situations like this, a uniform keeps people calm. You know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so they're, they're all, they're all sort of, they're all sort of nuts, but in, in all in, I guess, in, in ways that reflect, I don't know. Aspects. Well, some people are very distressed. Some people are really kind of, uh, how are we going to handle this? Particularly, because they have to cancel the caterer um, and the band because there's not going to be a wedding. And they have, what do they have? If anyone here has been to an Israeli wedding, 500 guests. Right. So 500, so that um, even if you decide when the book starts, to cancel the wedding, you'll never get to everybody at that time. So a day of, of quiet preparation and beauty is a day of chaos. And maybe that's Israel too. What could be a, a flower blooming in the desert is, is a balagan, is very um, excitable. I wanna just say one other thing about body parts. She's fabulous at body parts. Um, and they said, uh, here's one. And the, also on the second page, you know, she just brings you into it immediately. There's no introduction. Um, so I said that many of Matalon's body parts, I mean, of the characters, have dynamics of their own, as in this sentence. Her dyed blonde coif perked up in surprise over her forehead. So the body parts can be surprised. They can perk up, you know, they're like elements. Right, the mother's hair has all this emotional life of its own. Yeah. Exactly the right. Pop or the quiff, it's a, I can't, it's, it's a, it's a, it's like a spit curl, I guess. I can't quite picture what I have no is. idea. So I called it a quaff, which is probably <laughs> yeah. wrong. No, um, it's, it's a, the, I wanted yeah. to say something about the military because you mentioned it. Um, and what, um, it talks about this gay guy, who's Ilan. It's not that he's only gay. I don't want to sort of box him into that identity. But that's all that Ranit really shows of his life. And quote, Ilan, the boy, was exempt from military service due to, quote, incompatibility, close quote, though he insisted with fearsome resoluteness or with smug indifference, depending on his mood, that it was not he who was incompatible with the army, but rather the army that was incompatible with him. <laughs> Very Israeli, really. <laughs> Very Israeli and lovely, you know, and it's not my fault, it's yours. It's, that's um, the, I want to tell you the next thing that I wrote. They're, the people who are portrayed in this film are really perceived as ignorant. I would say they're ignorant. On the one hand, they're maybe a little bit cool and with it on the other, I don't know. What, what is the cool thing perhaps is that the bride wants to buy her groom the proper shoes for the occasion. Now, remember, this is an occasion that's going to happen once, and he'll probably never wear these shoes again. They are patent leather. 
And he's wearing them all the time that this he's is going wearing, on. He's in these horrible he's, shoes. He's wearing them. They're extremely uncomfortable. He's embarrassed that he has them on, but he kind of likes them a little bit. So she know, she's in the know. She knows where in Tel Aviv you can get black patent leather shoes for men. On the other hand, uh, her, her groom-to-be uh, talked about the fact that um, he talked about Leah Goldberg. And uh, he, it, Ramit writes, uh, my girlfriend was the, the girl I was going to marry the next day drove herself and me crazy because while we were watching a movie on TV about Leah Goldberg, I'm just going to say she's a famous, maybe the most famous Israeli poet from the early state period or, or Yeshuv period. So we were watching a movie on TV about Leah Goldberg, and I said it was too bad that I had never known, that I never knew her or met her, and that maybe I would have loved her for real and been able to rescue her from the difficult life she had with men who didn't love her. That's all I said. And Margie, she's the bride, she said, um, Leah Goldberg has been dead for years. Did you, wait one second. She had with men and not. That's all I said. Margie, she's dead. Leah Goldberg's been dead for five years. Do you get that? How can you throw a jealous fit over a poet who's been dead for years and not just that? but also tell me we're not right for each other and we have to call the whole thing off. Right, this is the fight that, that, that it seems to um, touch off this behavior, this this decision that she can't marry him is that her boyfriend, her fiance- Is in love with Dave. To Leah Goldberg, the, yeah. <laughs> so her ignorance is there, her, not just her intellectual uh, intelligence, but her emotional intelligence. She's really into getting the right shoes and he's having a conversation about a poet, and she uh, doesn't get it at all. And, and in fact, it's a problem. Ronnie loves to make fun of people. I'm so glad that uh, she never skewered me. But, <laughs> but she, one of the things that Israelis do is to make up new names. Um, and there is a woman named Pnina, who I believe is um, Margie's mother. No, the groom's mother. Groom's mother, I'm sorry. The groom's mother. And Penina doesn't want to just be Penina, which is a pearl in Hebrew. She wants to be unique. So she calls herself Peninit. There is no name like that. The name sounds like a baby, you know, like you would say uh, Lindale, you know, or something like that. And, and everyone is doing these kinds of things to make them stand out. Um, we also have another character um, who is a hypochondriac. And this is a guy who takes his blood pressure all day long. And I thought that was kind of good because I think uh, Ashkenazi Jews are portrayed as sort of, you know, they're always sick or they, they're, they're weak or they're this or they're that. So we have Arye. And his wife, of course, doesn't like it that he does that. And the final funny thing I want to say, and by the way, I've only commented on 36 pages. You know, it's so rich. So in Israel, and maybe in this country too, America, um, people like to have their wedding photographs in special places. So for example, um, I worked on a kibbutz for a year as a researcher. And one day, a limousine shows up. This is on a Hashomer Hatzayir Kibbutz, which means it's very socialist and very radical in terms of, you know, uh, we're all part of the working class, let's say. And uh, out steps the bride and the groom from this limousine, and they turn around and have the kibbutz behind them <laughs> for their wedding photographs. To me, that's absurd, but you know, okay. So he, we have a situation here where uh, the bride and groom want to have their wedding done, not only in a place that's 
lovely in their eyes, but also uh, that expresses some sort of value, which they don't even have, just like the kibbutz photograph. And um, so there was a phone call to the family in their home. And Pni Neet says, that was the photographer. Uh, she couldn't get a hold of you. And she said that you arranged to meet at five for the pictures in that park where the foreign workers hang out by the central bus station in Tel Aviv. I mean, there was- The Sudanese, right, the Sudanese refugees, you know, as a backdrop. <laughs> um, and then Mati nodded, have you seen my blood pressure of cuff? No, no, Pani, and then Panit, because people don't respond to what the other people are saying. They just say what they have on their mind. So uh, Panini did not respond to this uh, discussion and she glared at her son, the groom. What's the story with the Levinsky Park with all those Sudanese? You wanted your wedding pictures with the Sudanese, she asked. And then Nadia, who hadn't heard the previous conversation, that's the mother of the bride, comes in and says, what Sudanese? Nadja was having trouble following the conversation. Who's taking pictures of Sudanese? Not of them, Pneet clarified, with them in that park that they go to. For the wedding, um, we're gonna have a picture taken with them in the background with all those uh, Sudanese foreign workers they brought over here. Him and Margie wanted to do their wedding pictures. Can you believe it? And then um, Arye, the father says, I think it's a very nice idea to get their pictures there. It's very picturesque with all those blacks in their white clothes and Margie with the white dress. Very unique. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then yeah, Nadja says, how much did you, they ask to be photographed? Because for her, everything is transactional. Who asked? Asked what? What are you talking about? How many of them did you pay? Five? Even if each one didn't take a lot, that's still something altogether. I'm sure they wouldn't do the pictures out of the kindness of their heart. And so it goes on and on. Right, right. So so they're they're completely um they're well, they're they're all they're all these pretensions of sort of and somebody then says, well, of course, we have to share our joy, you know, with the less fortunate, something like that. So these pretensions exactly. of social justice. It's quite exactly. funny. I, I don't know if you have, I mean, there are many, many examples, but I, I have to say of all the, um, the the characters in the story, my favorite one is um, the emergency psychologist who is, oh, is that wonderful? the last minute. And she is a, she specializes in panicking brides on the day of the wedding and reluctant, and way, reluctant brides and you know they have to be talked you know back into having the wedding and apparently this is a bustling business and she's even interrupted in dealing with margie because she gets another call and she says oh this one's really an emergency a bride jumped out of the car on the way to the servant to the ceremony i gotta go with yeah you know, i'm out of time with you so i don't know i think that's that is a bridge to i think behind all this this comedy it sounds like there's some serious issues. I mean, I don't. I mean, there's there's this there's this question about female agency, um, which we might want to explore a little bit. Um, and then I have other questions about sort of the shadows beneath all this comedy. But you know, what about female agency? What's what's going on? Well, with this there are a lot of females in it. Um, the uh, well, there's the oldest person, right? The grandmother. And she's just representing Shalom Bayat, I would say. And she even accepts her uh, flamboyant gr uh, grandson. Then there's the next level, which is the family members. And they are, um, the two women, I think, are not agentic at all. They're trying to figure out always what would make them look good. You mean and, the mother and the mother-in-law? Yes. Yeah. And what would the neighbors say? Mm -hmm. and, and how are we gonna pull this off, keeping our veneer of normalcy and also affluence? Mm -hmm. um, it's they who, who know about this uh, psych psychologist who can do this. And Matalon, I think either she or when I wrote about it, I can't remember anymore, 
um, that there, for the Ashkenazis, for the people with money, there's a specialist for everything. Mm. So that is a way of giving away agency, you know, right. unless, so everything is then dumped on this psychologist who's supposed to make Margie come out of the room. And she doesn't, but she plays a, she does play a positive role at the end, although her physical description by Ron Matulid is horrendous. Um, she, she's like the skinny, skinny uh, woman who you could blow on and she would fall over, I think. But she what happens- hair, yeah. <laughs> but what happens is that somebody decides to call in a worker that has a, what is that called? A ladder a, truck, you know, like a fire yeah, a truck. A cherry picker, I think they call yeah, it. Yeah, that can get lift her up to the window so she could talk to the bride. <laughs> right. And so they do that and she talks to the bride and it might have had an effect. It's it's sort of unclear. The bride puts up a sign, says, uh, sorry, I think. But when, um, but the funny thing is not so much that crazy interaction through the third floor window, but the fact that the cherry picker is uh, rented with its driver from an Arab Palestinian Authority electric company. And so, you know, just like the Sudanese were brought in to do their thing, so here comes the Palestinian Arabs come in to do something to help out these people. And they screw it up uh, completely. And the neighbors think that this is a terrorist and the guy is hauled off to the police station. Right, and so, that's all we hear about it. Yeah, it's very... And so whatever these people do with their, with their uh, lack of understanding actually hurts other people. Mm. It's not just funny. It's, it's, uh, it's destructive, you know, as well. So, yeah. So, so here's another, I mean, with the, the story turns out to be, I mean, although it's short and it's funny, it's also surprisingly complex. I mean, the bride won't come out, but it also emerges in the course of the story that a younger sister in the family has disappeared some years before Right. And that with no explanation, it has never been heard of again, and that this has some mysterious bearing on events. I'm wondering, I mean, under all of this clowning, is this a story partly about trauma? That's possible. But, you know, it could, it could be, uh, going back to your previous question, it could be about female agency. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, the bride did get her groom to buy those shoes, but right. that's not really a great achievement. Then the bride got angry and um, about his love of Leah Goldberg. That's being a fool. And then the bride um, realizes she, she has an aha moment she realizes something is really wrong here. And she becomes agentic and saying no. Agentic, you mean she, she, she becomes an active force. Okay. That's right, that's what I meant. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and uh, the very last scene, this is not a spoiler because you can't spoil this book, it's so great. Well, don't tell about, don't, don't say exactly what happens at the end. Okay, I'll just tell you one thing. Yeah. She doesn't stay in and she doesn't come out. So you can figure that, yeah. you, can, yeah. you can think about that. Right. So um, I think what I'm trying to say is there's a little bit of agency, there's a lot of stupidity in the woman, and then a little bit, and it's very agentic, I'll use that word, to uh, close the door and say, I'm not coming, that's a big deal. And to me, that paralleled the, the role of women in Israel today. It's not one or the other. It's not like they don't have any power, but they don't have enough. They don't, mm -hmm. their representation in the Knesset is very poor. And they're, um, you know, a lot of women are still becoming teachers, obviously a profession I very much value, but they're underpaid and under, um, appreciated, etc. So maybe the only way that women can have power 
real power in that society to make a difference is if they say no to mm-hmm. what is going on, to whatever it is that's going on. Um, so it's a possibility, you know. I, I wish Ramit were here so she could say, Shula, what are you talking about? <laughs> did, did you know her? No. No? She no. sounds, she, it's, it's, it feels like when you read her, you feel like you know her, you know? That's it's, right. It's you very, want to sit next very, to her and yeah, poke I, fun at everybody. It's a very intimate voice. I, I have to say, I don't know, this is this is kind of out of out of line, but this reminds me so vividly of a story from my own family's immigrant uh, past where my, my grandmother, who was kind of a tough, tough girl and always had a tough time with her with her family who had you know they were they were new immigrants and they wanted her to marry this this guy this I don't know in the story he's a rich dairy farmer or something and they're in they're in this little town in upstate New York where where they're they've become where her father runs the general store and she she takes a bottle of iodine this apparently actually happened she took a bottle of iodine and locked herself in the bathroom and cried through the door mama papa if you don't tell me that I don't have to marry this guy, I'm going to drink this bottle of iodine. I won't come out till you say it. And supposedly they gave in, you know, and, and I it just, this, this feeling of having only this, like of having only a negative power, like all you can right. do is lock the door and say no, mm-hmm. seemed very, seemed to be full of pathos in a way, even though it's, it's kind of funny, but it's also very, um, very dramatic. Um, what do you think about making a political leap between saying no and getting us out of this bind that we're in in Israel in terms of a marriage or a friendship or a tolerance of uh, Palestinians or Arabs, etc.? See, saying no is the is the power that both sides are using. Hmm. Interesting. And, it's, and then it doesn't get you too far. Well, on the other hand, I mean, she got, I mean, in some ways, I mean, she didn't have to, she didn't get married. I mean, the um, the wedding was called off. Your grandmother. Oh, my grandmother. Oh, yeah, well, she got what she wanted. She didn't have to marry the guy. I think she always, yeah. had, all those years kind of wondered if, if, uh, if she had done the right thing. That's probably, you know, when you tell a story over and over and over like that, you're not completely resolved as to whether it was the right call, but... I know, but you said that she didn't have to marry him. I don't know if that we can deduce that from the story. We don't, uh, you know. Oh, you mean it. in in the what happened to the her? The very yeah. last line is not conclusive. That's true. She's well. Okay, that's fair. But did you notice the um, the groom waiting outside the door? Yes. At a certain point, he's described as feeling a sort of relief. Right. He was he also, feeling everything in this book. Yeah, but he also, it's not, I felt sort of, I mean, I, I, he didn't seem like the monster, but he also no. didn't, it didn't seem clear to me that he actually wanted to get married either. I mean. Um, that's that's a possible, yeah. So, and he, and he, but does he tried really, so hard to get her out. He does. He tries, he tries really hard. Well, and you know, you, you, you could, you could sort of, you can sort of see it. The, the other thing I'll ask, here's one, one other question, and you've kind of alluded to it with the, uh, with the Leah Goldberg thing. Um, a lot of these people, they're very inarticulate, but a lot of times when the story does move forward, it, it happens because of some kind of a text, some kind of other, somebody else's words. And at one point, for instance, Margie, when they, they're begging her to say something and she pushes under the door, this handwritten copy of a poem by Leah Goldberg. And then, you know, and then there's this 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 lively, completely brainless discussion ensues over what she means by it. None of them understand it. Half of them think she wrote it herself. And the the, the poor groom is like, no, that's a poem we read together by Leah Goldberg. Whoa, who is Leah Goldberg? What is that? You know, and then it does, it, it, oh, it, he thinks it has something to do with her sister who disappeared. And, um, you know, well, who, why is Margie writing poems? Oh, well, she's very bright. Of course she writes poems, you know, that, that, all that. But, but it's, it's, she can only express herself through this poem. And then later on in the story, it seems like the the grandmother, the, the grandmother who's out of it, begins to sing this Arabic torch song about stubbornness and, you know, your stubborn heart. Um, and 
that seems like it might be, I mean, if we're in, in so far as we get a resolution to the story, that's the closest we get. So I'm wondering, like, what about that? I mean, is this, it's interesting to me that one of them is an Arabic text too. I mean, what is- That's their background. We, yeah, well, how do we work that into into this this landscape? I mean, these people, they have a culture, they're surrounded by, you know, other writing. Right. The way I interpreted the Leah Goldberg thing is, is as you said, and then something else, which is that um, nobody understood why anyone would ever read a poem rather, or even or write one. It just was not part of their, it was not part of their value system. You know, the, right, but she well, is. I mean, Margie is in that yes. world a little bit. She's a student. Yes, because she went to university. Right. Um, it seems that what the people, the family, are interested, aside from Elon and his sexuality, is um, materialism, consumerism, and um, being accepted and fitting in. Mm -hmm. So that is partially Margie, remember the shoes, you know, what she wanted, et cetera. But the, their, Margie, as you said, is, a, is somewhat different from her mother. And, and from the other people. And I thought of the Leah Goldberg poem, which I can't believe she had memorized. I assumed it was a book, you know, like maybe everyone had to read in high school or junior high or whatever it is. And she copied it. And it was a message to her groom, to her boyfriend. Look at this. I am using the poetry of a woman that I, that I didn't remember and I ridiculed you for your love of her and I'm using this to reach out to you. So I, I thought that was a lovely uh, transition mm -hmm. from uh, in, I mean, we might be reading too much into it, but it is pretty, no, we're not. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, I, I think that's true. <laughs> um so that's how I saw this. Uh -huh. So but she's yeah. If we if we expand this into all the psychiatrists and the military and the shoe stores and the ignorance of history, um we get Israel. There you go. So all on a, it's sort of on the head of a pin. I mean, this very tiny short story with so right. many layers of um of Israel. And then um, well, I mean, and what about what about the disappeared sister? I mean, she seems to be completely central to this in a very subtle way. I mean, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but the, the, the younger sister, Natalie, she's three years younger and she disappears from school 10 years previously. And Margie, the groom remembers Margie talking about her, not, not about her, talking about how the mother would buy candy for years after Natalie disappears, the mother would buy her favorite candy every day and put it under the bed. And that after a while it would start to go bad, you know, and, and she'd it throw it out. Stink. And eventually she'd throw it out, but there would be times when it took her quite a long time to throw it out. And 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 the, then she ends, she says something like, you know, those times before she threw it out, they're the blackest of times. No, they're not even black. They're like no color at all. They're the color of no color. And 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 it's very intense. And not only for the bride, but also for this damaged mother, who's obviously, I mean, she's we see her in this comic mode, but in this, the, we get this glimpse of this this horrendous, you know, um, tragedy terrible suffering you know and and this this they don't know what happened to the to the girl so so um i mean i wonder how do you i mean what's what's matalon doing with all this this terrible this tragedy the comedy and the tragedy and that's also seems like a big part of israel right yes um i just want to I, I really liked what you said there about the significance of the girl i if i had one criticism of renit's book it would be about her treatment of that topic because oh. it, it comes in, you know, like two thirds into the, to the end. She's not she's not a presence from the beginning. So all of a sudden, we learn this thing that the the sister had disappeared. Yeah, and um, so it's a sister. So do, does Margie identify with her? Does she also want to disappear? Um, does she feel guilty? 
That's what she, I thought she wanted to disappear, but she couldn't do it that way because it had already been sister right. had already done that. But there is another um, interpretation, which may be a stretch, and that is that I would say nearly every family in Israel has one lost person. Mm. It used to be the Holocaust, you know, where there is holes in the family tree. But now it's the military. You know, when we just had the um, Yom HaZikaron and then um, we had Yom HaShoah and people are going, went to the graves of their fallen soldiers. Um, the announcers, or broadcasters said over and over again, just about every family has some grave to go to. Mm. Which is huge. I mean, I don't feel that way on Memorial Day in this country. Even if I wanted to go to a grave, I don't I don't have one to go to. I mean, I'm glad nobody died here in the military, but it's, it's so central and we don't feel that here. We don't right. know what that yeah. is. If you read novels from sort of the turn of the 20th century, people felt that way about their Civil War veterans and they would go and Memorial Day was much more central to the culture and there was there were you know the parades and the veterans and all that so yeah so sorry I and didn't people people who unfortunately have to endure this created sort of shrines not shrines like in uh, Indian culture uh, with flowers and candles and stuff but shrines of pictures and maybe um, a flag that they received once or the epaulettes, you know, so that there's a corner of the house that always remains in a room. Mm -hmm. And no one, no one can get out of that room either. I mean. Oh, interesting. So, so I, I, the disappeared person, even if you know everything about how a person died in the military, it's still never possible to fully understand that, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's there's a kind of mist like the spray oh, that she said of cleaning a house. The cleaning spray, a little. Right. Like, so I thought about it as a kind of metaphor for military losses. But you know, you don't have to read a book that way. Reading a book is like reading the Torah. You can do pshat, which means just on the surface, what is what is it saying? And you can laugh your head off. And then you can connect it to other books, mm -hmm. you can connect mm -hmm. it to the biography of the writer. You can connect it to the, um, the time in which it was written. With her books, they're so rich that you can read it in many different ways. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it, it's I, I don't mean to over I don't want to put too much weight on it, but it, there is sort of a mystery at the heart of this book, which is why won't the bride come out of a room? It's it's sort of designed around that stuff you don't know. They don't know. And right. so I just thought it was interesting that there was this other mystery echoing That's it true. in the family. I thought she couldn't have done that. I mean, obviously she's doing that on purpose, but it's not, I don't know exactly why. You said you had a um, a criticism of how she did it. Did, did you, did you, was that what, did you mean just to, to make it because it's so universal? I mean, you said it was one of your few criticisms of the book was how she handled the disappearing, the disappeared daughter. Yes, I thought it was too thin. Mm, okay. So, I yeah. think, you know, given your point that it's a central missing character, just like the bride is a central missing character. Right, right. I, th I think um, another couple of paragraphs, another couple of pages. Mm -hmm. um, it just seemed like Ronit put it in and it was just pain. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, it, it didn't, what it was it supposed to tell us that the parents were not good parents? Well, no, I mean, nobody knows. Also, I mean, she uses Natalie's doll to say yes, no. Remember when when they say, won't you come out? When the psychiatrist says, the psychologist says, won't you come out? There's this little bleeding sound like, yes, no, yes, no. And they go, wait, that's a doll talking. She's got Natalie's old doll that says right. yes, no, which is also very weird. I mean, again, these 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 women who can't who can't tell you anything about where they are. You know, it's just there seems like there seemed like a lot of. And the other thing is the family at one point, the, the, the crazy would-be mother-in-law, the one who's so full of, you know, pretensions, and she has this little tantrum about how she says to the psychologist, and they don't even 
they couldn't, this family couldn't get certified HDA, you know, we tried and tried and tried and no one would certify them, but which, and the, the psychologist says, God, what does that even mean? I, my Hebrew is not good enough. I don't understand what is HDA. And it's some kind of acronym for someone who died in enemy action, I guess. It's a, so in other words, they, the, the, the in-laws wanted this classified as, as terrorism. And even that couldn't be established. And that that's mm -hmm. some kind of a, a, a tension in the family also, because then Nadia gets up and rushes out of the room, you know, because it's been mentioned. And so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on with this, with this daughter, with this. Oh. But, you know, your point reinforces the one I was trying to make, that it's like a, a son, like the, mm -hmm. the military yeah. man, you know, who died. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. One last thing, I know we're coming to the end, um, and that is, who else wrote about a room um, where a woman and connected it to a woman. It's Virginia Woolf. Oh, and sure. Well, everyone, right? The yellow wallpaper, but yeah. Yes. A room, room of, of one own. own. So according to Virginia Woolf, every woman needs some money and a room of one's own. And somehow I felt that that's also part of this. Even if Vermeer didn't have that in mind, but the bride got to go into a room uh, the family was obviously willing to give her money if she wanted that. And, but in Virginia Woolf's concept, you don't think that the woman who wants a room of her own is going to stay in that room forever. Uh, whereas um, in Ronit's book, the bride does stay and she makes her most important decision, the most important decision of her life in a room that was her own for a while. Interesting with the door shut. So it's a feminist. It's a feminist statement. Um, Everything in my eyes is a feminist statement. Well, goes sure, and I mean it's an aspect of. Um, I mean, we've read in this series. Um, we've read a lot of books by women, um, and I mean, we read, we've I thought a good range of books, but we we read um, Dorit Rabignan's novel and also Ilana Kurshan's memoir, and so we have a lot of. It's it's not that we don't have women's voices. But it is nice to have a book in this, you know, to end on, which is specifically makes this femi sort of feminist critique, I would say, along mm -hmm. with a lot of other yeah. interesting things about Israeli society. So since we're coming to the end, um, I, I would I would actually like to ask you, and since it's the end of the series as well, you've done, um, I wanted to ask you to talk a little more broadly. You've done all this wonderful work in the Hadassah Brandeis Institute and through other Institute things you found it to bring underappreciated and less visible Israeli literature and particularly women's literature into you know to English speaking audiences. So tell us a little bit about that and send us off with um, you know like how should we read Israeli literature? Where should we look? Okay. So first, I want to say it's called the Hadassah Brandeis Institute, as Jamie, as Amy said, and as uh, Suzanne said. And you can look it up on, on the web and read all about it. We have the mission of the Institute is to develop fresh ways of thinking about gender and Jews uh, through conducting research, um, creating art projects, and um, encouraging community engagement. So it's it's an activist artistic scholarly endeavor and um we talk about the books <laughs> what book i this mean book. books talk about yeah, books. Tell, yeah, tell yeah. Us about books. so yeah. within the scholarly um within the book is is the idea of promoting um people who want to make a contribution to literature that's so what they do is they apply and we give grants out to writers to translators sometimes, and we help publish uh, books, not our own, we don't publish on our own uh, imprimatur, but um, to wherever they're going. And um, it's expensive to translate a book, but it is utterly necessary because I would say that 99%, I might be wrong, of American Jews don't speak Hebrew. 
And uh, the ones who do are because they came over here from Israel. And so we love or criticize or engage in a society whose language we don't understand. And we expect the people over there to speak our language. And because I don't think that's going to change very fast, we have to get um, literature produced in Israel translated so that we can read it. And that's one of the goals of the Havdasa Brandeis Institute. Um, so people, if they want to, uh, can make a gift and say, this is for translations. Mm -hmm. We will honor that and give it only for translations. So and I, I would be so sad if no one paid to have this translated or this translated, or, you know, go on did, and on. Did you, were you, um, was Hadassah Brandeis responsible for trans, for having all of Matalon's work translated? Did you discover her? No. So. I just, dis I discovered her uh, just as I was leaving HBI. So, but others, yes, others but also, I mean, there are. We there helped are Savion Liebrecht. Uh -huh. Savion Liebrecht. So here's my last, you don't know her? Okay, Savion I'm Liebrecht. so glad. A new, a new author. Okay, to send us off. A new Israeli Savion, okay, Savion Liebrecht, she's quite well known in Israel. She does uh, short stories and novels. She's, um, I would say, kind of parallel, but Mizra, uh, Ashkenazi. And um, she wrote a story called Apples in the Desert. Mm -hmm. And it's about, it's the same kind of thing again. It's around marriage. Because hmm. marriage is when the, the women have the possibility sometimes of making right. an active statement about what they want. So this is about a Haredi girl who leaves her Haredi family in Me'a Sharim or somewhere and goes to a kibbutz, hmm. falls in love with a kibbutznik and has to balance between leaving her mother and being with her partner between different lifestyles. And it's, again, the conversions of difference. Um, okay, good. Conversion of difference. Don't tell us anymore. Leave us. Leave us. One uh, thing she, I will not say anymore, but she, that story, that story, uh, Apples in the Desert, is required reading in many high schools. Oh, okay. Good to know. Here's right, my pitch. Okay. I want Apples this to be desert. required reading. Okay. In many Israeli uh, high schools, and I want people to pay for translation of books. Great. And okay, everybody, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shulamit, for this, this deep dive into this lovely novel. And thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone who has been at this session and the whole series. I hope we've also tried opening some doors to Israeli um literature of a wide variety of, of you know a lot of different voices a lot of different rooms um and manny i'm going to turn it back over to you but i also want to thank the federation for doing this with us and and helping so much and sort of you know shaping helping us shape the whole thing and look everybody go out and read a lot of um books by israeli authors look for them in moment look for them in shulamit's shop and you know just <laughs> anywhere and here, thanks here. so much here, here. Okay. Amy, thank you. And Dr. Reinhardt, thank you. You have my pair of ears perked up throughout. <laughs> I, I think, I, you know, I think I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of our listeners and watchers uh, today. Just the appreciating what Matalon offers in today's shifting landscape in Israel, the social, the political, um, the complexities that are societal, but are also familial, that are, you know, that, that affects gender, that are, and, and, and your idea of a, uh, of a march of the living, perhaps, to other countries certainly resonates. I think that, that multicultural Judaism is something that we need for a more connected uh, Jewish peoplehood, um, and really just appreciated your reading and sharing with us about Matalones and the bride closed the door. Um, Amy, want to thank you for not just today, but really uh, for being such a great partner and and thoughtful facilitator of the whole series. Um, I also want to thank your colleague, 
um, Moment Magazine's Director of Special Projects, Suzanne Bourdain, um, and so many of my colleagues who were involved in making this series possible. Of course, this is the final of a five-part series um, and appreciated the way the two of you wrapped up so many of the key themes that we explored together. Um, this is also the final uh, program of our Israel 75. Um, so just want to encourage folks to stay connected to the Federation. Um, visit shalomdc.org to learn about future opportunities, to stay connected, connect with purpose, um, and just thank you for being part of this uh, meaningful exploration. Have a great day.